One of many voices of a bygone era of figurine compatibility with video games, Disney Infinity rose to the top of the charts in both arenas of its craft. Toy brands that implement two halves of a whole, the toy being one of these halves, are more often than not the more successful brands compared to those that are solely what they are. Like I mentioned with Ninjago, the LEGO theme's success can be directly attributed to the TV show being treated as supplemental content to boost the sales of the actual toys. But when you hinge one on the other, that's a whole nother story of dependency. This is the story that was written for Disney Infinity. If you aren't familiar with the concept of video game compatible figurines, which I kinda doubt, but as someone who writes these kinds of essay things, I know I have to treat each topic as deadly serious as possible and explain even the most mundane things for the sake of coherence. Video game compatible figurines, the less of a mouthful term for this being toys to life, is a system implemented into a video game where you can purchase a physical figurine or toy and use it in whatever video game it was made to exist within. The most currently relevant example of this is Amiibo, and the least currently relevant example of this is today's topic, Disney Infinity. The way these figures work is that there's some kind of technology that I don't want to get all detailed about hidden within both the base the figurine stands on and whatever touchpoint is implemented either in the console or additional hardware included with whatever game. When you touch the figurine to the predetermined touchpoint, for example the joystick of the right Joy-Con on a Nintendo Switch or the portal that comes with a Skylanders game, this figurine will appear in the game after the information specific to that figurine is processed. Both of these examples have slight differences as well. The touchpoint on a switch is used as just that, a quick touchpoint to scan the information in the figurine, while the portal that comes with Skylanders has to have you actually plug into your console. Then you sit the figurine on there and leave it. I don't know if this is some kind of software limitation, or has some kind of gameplay element behind it, or if it's just for aesthetics, or all of it. Let me know if you know why this is. So, you've got the toy part locked down, now you have the bigger part of the puzzle to complete. That of what kinds of games commonly use the toys to life element. To be fair, there are only about a dozen types of toys to life brands, and a lot of them have been discontinued. But they do all paint a picture of the many ways this kind of technology can be utilized. Of course, the poster child for toys to life, Skylanders video games are often action platforming slash RPG games with each entry in the series being a little different and introducing different gameplay every installation, from between the first game's release date of 2011 to when the series was eventually put on a long hold and quietly discontinued in 2016. Amiibo, however, are used across multiple Nintendo games in various ways. The most common use for them is to give you some kind of power-up, outfit, or other collectible exclusive to that Amiibo, like costumes in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, clothing pieces in Splatoon, and ingredients in Breath of the Wild, for example. The Amiibo also have a particularly notable implementation, which they were pretty much purposefully made for, as an extra to Smash Bros. Starting in Super Smash Bros. 4, for both the Wii U and 3DS, you could use the new NFC touch points built into both in order- Disney Infinity came in the prime time for this kind of game. Large-scale toys-to-life console games were at their particular peak from about 2012 to 2015 with Skylanders being the longest lasting in this genre, having a good 5 years over alternatives 2 or 3 years. Not counting Amiibo because there was never really a specific game made for the Amiibo, rather the other way around. Following the success of Skylanders, and after having a fair foray into video games, Disney saw a good opportunity unfolding in front of them. Inspired by an open gameplay mode in a recent video game made after Toy Story 3 by Avalanche Software, Disney Infinity would be a half-adventure, half-sandbox type game allowing players to explore an open world based off of the many properties that Disney owned at the time, including their own personal IPs, as well as Pixar, Star Wars, and Marvel. The gimmick of Disney Infinity would lie mainly in the collectible character figures, which is why a sort of scaled-back and relaxed gameplay style was chosen to basically just highlight the titles and characters they would show off. The characters are what I want to focus on rather than the game itself, because I feel like they can meritably be treated as toys or collectibles, like the other things I cover on here and like with Ninjago. I can't clearly separate the toys from the game, so I just chose to shove all of it into a toy video. The figures themselves are pretty well made, sculpted in this stylized way how they'd also appear in the game itself. They would be posed in such a way that sort of spoke to who that character was on a personal level, and whatever characters had to be translated from 2D to 3D were done so with a lot of care. A specific attention to detail was taken to these figures for the secondary purpose of making them able to be collected, to have something fun and nice to look at 
especially if a character got made that didn't have a lot of, or any, similar figurines or merch made of them. This becomes crucially important later because Disney makes a pretty big brain marketing move near the end of things, but I won't spoil too much of it just yet. Over the course of its run, Disney Infinity got three games, or rather versions of the game, Disney Infinity, Disney Infinity 2.0, and Disney Infinity 3.0 with the first game retroactively being dubbed as 1.0 to differentiate. Wildly impressive naming skills there, Disney. All of the games acted as kind of like a mini-game of whatever franchise was featured, as well as allowing you to access a sandbox mode where you didn't have to play through the given world with only that world's characters. It's worth mentioning that both characters and worlds were accessed through the purchase of figurines. I would imagine that the base game came with at least one figurine and the additional chip little thing you need to access that character's world once you get in the game. So, the base that Disney Infinity came with, called the Infinity Base, had two spots for the figurines to be set there, and another separate spot to put in the world discs that would open up the world shown on the disc. Each installment of Disney Infinity featured both new worlds and their characters, so in a way, you're paying for more of a free romp Kingdom Hearts minus all the confusing lore. A big gripe about this game when it came out was the pricing. The base starter pack, which came with the game, Infinity Base, three characters and their worlds, would cost $75, which would be $96.85 today. You could also get a two-character pack on its own for $29.99, which would be $38.71, and singular characters would sell for $12.99, which would be $16.78 today, so all of the prices were pretty steep. So I do still need to talk about what characters were featured in Disney Infinity, and there is a surprising number of them. This was intended to be the end-all be-all of Disney games, the biggest and most collaborative piece of media they could ever make, the everybody is here of the House of Mouse. Disney Infinity 1.0's main anchor characters at release included ones from Pirates of the Caribbean, Monsters Inc., The Incredibles, Cars, Toy Story, and the then upcoming Lone Ranger movie Disney was behind. There were also other characters announced and released in the time between 1.0 and 2.0, and from 2.0 to 3.0 and after. To be completely honest, I don't have a great reference for what came out when, so I'll just try to fill in as reasonably as I can. 2.0 released in 2014 and was basically the Marvel version, introducing Avengers, Spider-Man, and Guardians of the Galaxy characters due to the first Guardians movie releasing that year. 3.0 released in 2015, and its main theme was Star Wars, to coincide with the beginning of the third trilogy with The Force Awakens in the same year. This entry would introduce characters from the original trilogy, the prequels, and some from the upcoming movie as well as characters from Star Wars Rebels, an animated Star Wars series that had just begun airing the year prior. 3.0 also added characters from Inside Out and Zootopia. Disney Infinity also had classic Disney characters, namely a few of the princesses, Mickey Mouse and Friends, Villains, and Baloo from The Jungle Book. Other characters include ones from Big Hero 6, Lilo and Stitch, Tron, Wreck-It Ralph, and The Nightmare Before Christmas, as well as The Good Dinosaur for whatever reason, and also Phineas and Ferb, but more like Phineas and no Ferb. There's something to be said about the collectability of these things, which is why I want to dedicate a portion of the video to that, because literally I saw that Nova got a figurine and every cell in my body was about to burst. I immediately took to eBay and was able to find a fair amount under $10, but then I thought, why stop there? That Davy Jones one is really cool too, maybe I might take a look at that. Oh my god! So there's apparently a worth system here that I'm not aware of that Disney Infinity aficionados are, but worry not. Disney themselves also fed into this element a little. Alongside normal sculpts of characters, a few of them got these crystal clear versions, which I would call more cloudy clear, but that's just me. Anyway, a select few of the characters in Disney Infinity would get these special variants, specifically Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey, The Lone Ranger, Perry, Jack Sparrow, Buzz Lightyear, Sully, Lightning McQueen, and Mr. Incredible. The gameplay benefit to these figures was that when used in the game, these character variants would earn their experience points at a faster rate and would see a boost in their ability compared to their regular counterparts. In the US, these figurines would be exclusive to the equally speedily dying retailer Toys R Us. The Star Wars figurines were also special on their own in reference to this. No more crystal variants would be made of characters, and rather, the collection sales point would be completely exhausted on the Star Wars characters. A few of the lightsaber wielders in the lineup had a gimmick worked into them that, when placed on the Infinity Base, would allow their lightsabers to light up. This isn't true for all of them, only Anakin, Obi-Wan, Luke, Darth Vader, Yoda, Kanan, and Kylo Ren. Ezra is the only one who has one lightsaber that does not light up, and Ahsoka and Darth Maul's lightsabers don't light up because Ahsoka had two held in a weird position, and Darth Maul's lightsaber had a strange double-sided makeup. All of the light-up characters would be exclusive to a different retailer, 
literally making you hunt them down the way they did with Amiibo and the same time span. One super special figurine was made for the D23 Expo for one of the years covered by Disney Infinity of Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey, where the stars on his hat are silver instead of the normal blue. Only 5,000 were made of this figure, so I would imagine that these are quite pricey nowadays. In general, again, there are different price ranges for different figurines. I don't know how much of this is organic or what was just dubbed by fans given each character's rarity, whether that was an intentional rarity or not. The wiki in particular that I found on these says that the light-up figurines were a dollar more than the normal single figurines at $14.99, so this tells me that by 2015, the light-up figurines would end up costing $19.03 today. And the normal figurines would have costed $13.99, a dollar more than normal by that year, which would be $17.76 today. Considering the attitude that mouse-worshipping Disney adults have, I'm almost- By 2016, things started to slow down with no releases for the game, no new characters or worlds. There was a planned fourth version for 2017 that would have new characters from the upcoming movies that the Disney company had ahead of them, like Coco and their newer planned Marvel movies. This version never came to be, but was reportedly deep in development when the series was canned. Something with this much weight to it in terms of licensing, production, and marketing couldn't stand on just whatever budget Disney was allotting to games. With something like Smash Brothers, you have Nintendo able to put more money toward games because that's all they do, whereas on Disney's side, while they might have astronomical amounts of money, there isn't a very big portion of that that they can allot to games. Especially if it's money they could spend on making something that they know will pay for itself, like a movie or an improvement at the parks. Historically, Disney's games haven't always done great. I guess if you count Kingdom Hearts, that was pretty successful and still is. But they partnered up with a well-known and previously successful game developer, Square Enix. And all of Disney's other licensed games, while good, never did Kingdom Hearts good. I have no idea how well Dreamlight Valley is doing, but it is very popular with people who are too straight for Animal Crossing. So, now what? Thankfully, in terms of the game, they were pretty much designed so that you always have access to every aspect of the game regardless of how old it gets. Huge shade to every online heavy game. You still have all of your worlds, characters, and everything you need to use the game for the rest of time until forever both in-game and physically. The figurines would stop being produced, of course, as would all Disney Infinity stuff, but like I mentioned briefly before, Disney made a really cool move with the brand after things ended. Do you like the way that the Disney Infinity figurines look? Do you maybe wish they were able to actually be played with so it justified the cost? Do you wish the sexy skeleton grandpa from Coco ended up making it into the game? Don't tell anyone I said that. Well, all of these emotional itches can be scratched by the Disney Toy Box line of action figures. Cleverly named after the Toy Box mode in Disney Infinity, these action figures would also be designed in the same art style as the game. The only glaring differences being the toy's scale and articulation. Understandably, they also don't have the same angular personality and dynamic posing. This is because they're action figures and not permanently forced to be still in play. Now, these are a lot more coveted than their static counterparts, presumably because of this fact alone. One particular gripe of mine is that even if a character got into Disney Infinity and got a figurine made of them because of this, it wasn't necessarily a guarantee that Disney would also make a toy box figurine of them. This is kind of a missed opportunity in my opinion, because you already have the character modeled out and everything. All you need to do is kind of simplify it and give it joints. Doesn't it seem like a good choice monetarily to take advantage of the resources you already have rather than immediately exhaust them on creating new characters? Of course, this wasn't the case for many of the characters, just mainly those who were a little less popular. These look pretty cool, I love the Disney Infinity style already. Making them into actual playable figurines was definitely a smart move. Not only does it solidify a certain look to a Disney brand of toys, it also carries on the legacy that quite a few kids grew up seeing grow. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, Toys to Life is a bygone era of experiences. It's something I kind of missed out on. I actually picked up Skylanders for the Xbox 360 in about 2017 or so, so there had been another generation of consoles out by then, but I did grow up when the hype was going around. I wanted to add a little bit of clarity to the end of this video, that not all Toys to Life games have died out. It's just not as heavily used. Like the Amiibo example I gave a lot, they are still implemented into Nintendo games where they reasonably can be, and with the rise of AR and VR, Toys to Life has been referenced or played on in a way by a few mobile games and such. Toys to Life is such a fun and interesting concept, 